everybody, it's Denise from Something Beautiful Handcrafts. Hello to all my friends. And this is a video, it's probably going to be a series, about the sock knitting machine. I've had a lot of questions from curious friends about what it does, how it works. And so I figured the fastest way to answer those questions is to actually make a complete video of me making a sock from start to finish. And uh, if you've seen any of my videos, you know I'm real big on start to finish because there's a lot of things that kind of go on in between that people don't understand about handmade items. And you know what, even commercially made items, I, th I really think that people should watch some of those videos on how a sweater is made or how a Tootsie Roll is made, even like that How It's Made series uh, is really good to watch because I think you have a better appreciation of the things that are made in this world, whether mechanized or by hand. Uh, and you know what, and even some things that are partially mechanized, you'd be surprised how many of those things have to be finished by a human hand. And I think there'll be a much better appreciation of what crafters do, what artisans do, what factory workers do if you watch these videos on how things are made. Okay, so anyway, uh, sorry about my Monday sermon. So let's go ahead and get started. This right here, um, this particular sock knitting machine is called the New Zealand Auto Knitter. There are several different sock knitting machines. Um, off the top of my head, the one I know the best by brand is the Gearheart machine. Uh, there's another one with an L name that escapes me. I really should know it. And then there are some vintage ones that are no longer in production. Sock knitting machines date back to, I want to say, Victorian age at least. So uh, you can get a 100-year-old, 150-year-old sock knitting machine. And they work just fine when uh, they've been maintained or refurbished. Okay, so when I say sock knitting machine, I think a lot of people think that um, I just put the yarn in here and it just does all the rest. And I think um, when I say the name of this machine, the New Zealand Auto Knitter, that pretty much everything I'm really doing here is automatic. I'm just turning the crank. And that is so far from the truth because I had someone ask me, well, do you feel like sock knitting with this is still handmade? Oh, yes, because I'm not just putting the yarn uh, through the guide and cranking and it's going to do the entire sock. Oh, not even. What is the best thing about it is that it still has needles and I don't have to have my hands on two sets of needles. It can move a lot faster than my hands can, but I'm still moving these needles with the help of a gear. I'm still threading it. And when it comes to turning the heel, the ribbing and the toes, I'm still manually guiding the machine. So I'm not doing it manually with my hands and, and uh, needles like that way, but I'm still doing it this way. And it can knit a lot faster than I can turning the gears. So that's what's really cool about it. It just really increases the speed, but I am still setting up and physically manipulating the machine. So you're gonna see me do this. Now there are like a ton of videos already about sock knitting, two things. Cause you know, generally I don't make videos when there's already videos about the subject, but well, maybe I should say three things. First of all, uh, this is mainly geared towards uh, the people who know me, my friends, so they're more likely to watch a sock video if I'm the one narrating it. You know, when you know the person, it makes it more interesting. Uh, number two, uh, there are a lot of sock videos when people don't talk, and I used to make videos when I didn't talk, and I, now I kind of find those videos a little annoying. Sorry for you guys who still make videos and you don't talk. I just don't like them anymore. So I'm going to talk through this one. I'm going to do a lot of talking, talk, 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 drive myself crazy. Uh, and number three, I don't, I'm not an expert in sock knitting. I've only had this thing, not even a month yet, but I have made a complete sock in that time. So I figure it's fair for me to talk you through 
uh, what the sock making process as I know it. Uh, since I, I know enough about the machine to make a completed sock and okay so maybe fourth uh, this will help my mentor kind of pinpoint the places where I'm lacking in knowledge because then she'll be able to see me physically walk through a sock and she can say oh okay when you did that uh, this would have been more efficient if you had done this way or this is how you got this wrong so this, this video is not just to you know help my friends understand what's going on or to demonstrate the machine, but it, it will also help uh, those who are helping me uh, understand what it is exactly that I'm doing, uh, pinpoint those places where I could be doing it better, um, or, or give me those little extra tidbits of knowledge that uh, you can only glean when you see someone in action and you're able to uh, pick up on how they're working. So here we go. Now, like I said, uh, it's called the New Zealand Auto Knitter, or I like to call it the NZAC. And Auto Knitter is its name. It doesn't automatically knit, uh, but it did come from New Zealand. So the actual company is in New Zealand. Uh, you know, I don't know the year on this machine. I should probably ask, but um, it was bought and shipped directly from uh, New Zealand. And I want to say that the previous owner was the first owner of this machine. I don't know, but it's really set up quite nicely. So when it came to me, uh, I, I'm on the impression that the auto knitters always come assembled from what I was reading the manual. So it came to me, of course, assembled for the most part. And uh, what wasn't assembled was fairly intuitive for me to put together. Okay, let me see if I can talk you through this. Um, this little guy right here is the river. Hopefully you can see that well. And it does exactly what it sounds like. It makes a rib. So let me show you a hand knit sock. Okay, hopefully I wasn't too much in your camera view. Okay, this is one of my hand knit socks. And you can see that up here. This is the rib part of the sock. And normally I would do this by hand. Then this is the body of the sock in what's called stock and neck stitch and the heel and of course the toes. So this machine right here is what makes the rib stitch because the auto knitter only knits in a knit stitch, which is the stockinette. You know, I need to get a, you know, it'll be easier to see on this one. Okay, so when you're looking at a knit item and you see those little V's, that is the knit stitch. When you're looking at a knit item and you see those little loopy U's, that's the purl stitch. So as a hand knitter, I can do a knit stitch and a purl stitch on the same side. We call this the right side. The sock knitting machines or actually any of the knitting machines, I'm not sure about the flat ones, but the circular knitting machine, the sock knitting machine, it only makes knit stitches on the right side and purl stitches on the wrong side. So in order to get that rib with purl stitches on the knit side, you have to have a ribber. And the ribber sits on top here. And that's pretty much at the moment all I can tell you about the ribber because I haven't used it yet. I have not ribbed the socks. What I've been doing is taking the socks off of the machine with the heel and toe. Oh, let me start, go back. What I was first doing was taking the sock and just making a tube. And my plan was to cut in what's called afterthought heel and then attach a toe and then do a cuff. But I decided to go ahead and try making the heel and the toe. So now the socks are coming out with heels and toes and I'm going to hand do the ribbing and I think I would like to make several more pairs before I attempt to use a ribber. Okay, so there's that. At any rate, there's a ribber. Okay, this is uh, the cylinder. The cylinder contains the needles. And at the moment I have two cylinders. I have a cylinder with 54 needles and this cylinder right here has 64 needles, which is what I use for a standard size um, medium sock. So basically, I'm a size six, and this would probably do 
maybe four, five, six, seven, maybe eight. Um, so a, a lady's sock, roughly, or a teenager's sock, depending, because my nieces are like 13 and 15, and they wear a bigger shoe size than I do, so it depends. Um, at some point, a 72 needle is going to arrive, and that would be like men's socks. And 64 is basically the same amount of needles that I use, or same amount of stitches that I cast on when I make a sock by hand. So it's, it's, it's really familiar to me. Okay, now, uh, these are the cams, of course, and they're attached to the gear, the wheel down here, the crank. I probably have to tilt that so you can see the crank. Let me tilt it so you can see the hand crank. Hopefully it's not too dark. Okay, sorry about the bouncy camera. This is the hand crank. I'm not going to crank it at the moment because, as I've been told, and I don't want to find out for myself, cranking this without yarn um, damages the needles. So we're just not gonna do that. Uh, a, a box of needles is like 50 bucks. Uh, I don't wanna replace a lot of needles. I've already broken three. Okay, so on the needles, there's a little hook, a little latch. The needle comes up, grabs a yarn, it goes down, the latch flips over top of it, holds it in place down here. And as it spins around, needles lift up, they grab yarn, they pull it back down, they latch. And then what happens is the same thing that happens when you're knitting needles at hand. Um, as this next round comes around, it gets latched and it pulls the yarn that is already on here through. It, th this one that's, that's coming on is gets pulled through the loop that's already on here. And all that's all knitting is is a series of pulling loops over top of the other loops. And if you pull it, uh, this way, it makes a knit stitch. If you pull it from the front this way, it makes a purl stitch. Okay, so that's basically all that's happening with this machine, except it's doing it really, really, really fast. A lot faster than I can slide them off on my needles by hand. So, basically, it's like a robot knitting. Uh, this right here is the, let me start from here. The yarn comes up through the yarn mast, goes through the guides, comes across here, goes under the stop into one of the guides, and then down from the guides into uh, the yarn mess, into the yarn guide uh, through the front. There's a little spring on the back here to give it a little more tension, and then out to the needles. Okay, uh, I can, there's a tensioner on the other side. It's been marked for me, and I'm just gonna leave it alone. There's no reason for me to bother the tension. Uh, if I start changing different yarns, maybe if I have a hand spun up sitting through there, I might want to change the tension. But for now, we're just going to leave it alone. Over here is a counter. Oh, and that is very important. Hmm, yeah, you should be able to see the counter over here. It's a row counter because if I want my socks to match, uh, it's probably good that I can tell where I started and stop that to make heels and toes and the length of the foot and all that kind of stuff. And I'll show you the calculation book so you can get an idea of how important it is for me to be able to count rows. Okay, and right here, when the, when the machine first came, I didn't actually know what this was. I had taken it off because I didn't want to break it, but this is the little magnet right here that allows the machine to know how to count the rows. So every time I pass this little spot over here, with the detection, it counts it as a revolution. This auto knitter came with legs that attach to the, um, I don't know, I want to call this the gearbox, I think. But uh, some of the other ones had stands that you set it on, but this one is actually attached to the machine, and this is all one solid piece, which is really cool. So really, I just had to uh, take this piece, screw the legs in, uh, put the yarn mast on and put the hand crank on and just kind of get started. I have made some adjustments to the yarn guide and I'm going to have to make some more adjustments because when I'm turning the heel, the spot doesn't catch and I couldn't figure that out and that's mostly because of the adjustment I made for the yarn guide. Okay, that is the really quick run through of uh, this actual machine.
the rest makes more sense to tell you as I work. So let's go to part two. Okay, so I apologize for the audio in the first part. Um, as we know, I live in the city, not quite in the hood anymore, but it's basically still the city. And so I'm just yard to yard with neighbors and I really can't control um, if they're going to play loud music or talk loud on the phone, have kids run around, dogs barking, UPS, USPS, Amazon FedEx. It's just kind of hard, you know, I don't live in a peaceful, you know, countryside. So uh, occasionally if I am not in the back room kind of closed up, you, you're going to hear the, you know, sounds of daily life, uh, which is one of the reasons I don't try to video outside. Although the lighting is better, uh, there's a lot more noise going on out there. And I don't always have the protection of, you know, the barriers of walls to keep the noise down. Ah, so sorry about that. At least as far as I could tell, it wasn't like really loud, vulgar rap music. Then that probably would have been a problem. I would have had to reshoot the video. So at any rate, um, you maybe you recognize this book. I need a new one, something a little cuter. Uh, this is the fiber study book. And inside of it are the study pages for breed studies. Uh, this, these particular pages I created myself. Uh, then there are the study pages for weaving. And these ones are from Peggy Osterkamp's website. And also, just to keep everybody in the same spot, this is the sock, uh, the circular sock machine CSM sock worksheet. And this one is from, hey look, Cheryl Roy, uh, the shepherdess, the 1764 shepherdess. Dot com and I try to remember to put the link that in the description so I was gonna create my own but this is just such a really cool page so no reason to read the world okay so if you've ever seen me do anything you've ever worked with me uh, you went to college with me like you passed me on the street you know everything I do is like really thoroughly planned out even when it looks like I'm winging it it's because I've already planned it out and done it before so I'm just repeating that and I'm really obsessed with my socks matching. And the only way to do that is to plan. So this is like the best worksheet ever. I love worksheets. Must be a teacher thing. So you have the finished size here. And you mark it. Men's, women's, child, toddler, baby. The yarns is really important because different yarns work up differently. you got to know that they require different tensions. The sock name machine used, which for me is always going to be the Inzac. And I know people who have more than one, which is how I got the NSAC anyway. Uh, and that's just a wonderful thing. I have more than one spinning wheel, so I understand what it means to have more than one machine, more than one of anything. Uh, the cylinder size. Now, my cylinder size is not marked on here. I got a 60 instead of, I have a 64. This is a 60. So I just scratch over top and put it on there. 54 is still packed. The 72 is on its way. But different cylinder sizes make different socks different thicknesses, uh, different stitch count. So it's kind of important to know which one you used. You think you'll remember, but I'm climbing past, you know, the 40s. So I don't always remember what I think I'm going to remember. Now the gauge. Oh, I should have brought a ruler with me, but I brought a sock and uh, hand knitters understand the gauge. And I very seldom knit anything that requires a gauge, but this is really important here. You have to know how many rows per inch you get because that is how you measure the amount of the, the amount of rows that you're going to crank out to get a particular length. And it's different for different socks, uh, different yarns is different for different adjustments on the machine. So this is really important. And I get 11 rows. Well, it's more like 11.5 per inch. That is my gauge for what I have set on that machine in this one. So for four inches, I would get 44 rows. Well, more like 46 when I'm adding the halves in, but we, we, we're okay with that half. Okay, so I know that 
for every inch I measure on my leg from wherever it's going to start on my leg down to the instep, which is where I'm starting the heel at my instep, right above my ankle, I know that I have to account for 11 rows for every inch. And that's how I determine how many rows are going to go here. Okay. Now, there's the foot circumference, the foot length, and the other. I don't deal with the foot circumference in this case because most of the time I find the sock will stretch. And so I don't really worry about that. I have a small foot, but it's wide. So when it comes to wearing shoes, I really want to know my foot circumference. When it comes to making socks, it's not so much a big deal for me. Okay. But I measure my foot length from the... Uh, heel to the tip of the toe and that is really important that gives me another set of of how many rows I need to crank to achieve a sock that'll fit me where to stop cranking and then to add on the um, the toe okay number of needles used because if I was making a child sock and I was doing it on a 48 or 54 I wouldn't use 48 or 54 needles even though that's what the cylinder holds so you don't always use all the needles on the cylinder. So that may be important for me. It's not because I'm making the sock for the needles required in the cylinder. I'm not taking anything out or adding anything in. Okay, now I check my construction just in case I forget. Um, what I'm doing, toe up, cuff down, hem, the ribber, mock rib or other. Okay, when I knit my socks by hand, they are always toe up. Two reasons. Uh, firstly, because a lot of times I'm knitting from one ball of yarn. Yes, I do it all the time. And I make a sock that is like a crew sock. This one is longer than that. But a lot of my socks are crew socks. So I'm knitting from the bottom up and I'm knitting to the very last, you know, inch. So it's a lot easier to stop when you run out of yarn. If you're going down, then there's a lot more calculations to have to be put into place. And when I'm knitting by hand, I'm just knitting. I don't do any calculations. That's another reason why I go toe up. Because I've tried on my foot as I go up. So I don't have to do any measurements of how many stitches I should have on my toe. I don't even... The, the books tell you. The, the patterns tell you how many stitches you should wind up with because you like, cast on eight and then you increase a certain amount till you get to a certain amount and then you start the foot. And I don't do any of that. I just cast on a certain amount and I try it on. When it fits across the width of my foot, then I stop increasing and I go up. And when it fits right around the instep at the back of my heel, then I start my heel and go up. Okay, so I bypass all of those instructions because I am um, going toe up. I just try it on, which is also one of the reasons why I don't make socks for other people generally because I feel the need to go toe up because I'm not really following a pattern based on the size of that person's foot. I've only made socks for one other person, my sister-in-law, and I think I drove her crazy trying them on. Okay, in this case... I'm not doing that. I'm actually following the uh, prescribed patterns for the heels and toes. There's a website where you can calculate the, um, the number of rows you need for legs, heels, and toes. And it kind of spits it out based on your shoe size and estimated length or your actual length. So you can input that in there. So I did that for a couple different people, mostly people in my family, which gives me a good range of average size feet. And because of this handy dandy worksheet, I have marked it all in there. And now I have like a reference uh, based on the yarn I'm using and the cylinder I have, I have a good reference of, you know, average socks to crank out. Brilliant. Okay, now on this machine, I'm going cuff down. Uh, and the reason why I started with cuff down on the machine, because first of all, toes and heels are something to master even by hand. And I didn't want to start off just knowing the machine, getting to learn, trying to turn a heel or trying or trying to turn a, uh, a toe. So I cranked tubes only. So the next logical step was I was cranking this tube and I got to the point where I was done with the leg and I was like, ah, I guess I'll try a heel. So going, you know, cuff down made that a lot easier.
just went ahead and put a heel there. And then I was like, oh, I think I'll just do a foot and went all the way down. Okay. Um, these ones are not hemmed, but I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe I'll do this for you guys. Maybe I'll do one more sock and then I'll do it. But I can always hang a hem. And basically what that is, is on the machine as you're cranking down, right? Imagine this is my sock and it's being cranked down. What you actually do is lift up a bottom row of stitches, attach them to the row of stitches you have that you're cranking, and it closes the sock hem like this, right? It's really cool. And then you just continue cranking the sock down. So now you have a closed hem. It's just so neat, okay? Though I still, I might try it. I still kind of like the ribbed hem, so I still might just go ahead and leave the hems uh, unfinished like that and knit my uh, rib on. So I haven't decided. Or you can do a mock rib, which I haven't done either. So at any rate, so if you are making a hem, whether it's a ribbed hem, a mock rib, or a hemmed hem, uh, you have to have a certain amount of count. You want to know that I do 30 and then I folded that. 30 would be kind of short because, I mean, look at these rows. So you might do like, you know, 50 or something and then fold that over and do the hung hem. So you need to have a count for that because you want them to match. You don't want a hem that's this wide on one and a hem that's that wide on the other. That's no good. And then you have to have a count for the leg and a count for the foot. And then some notes, you know, if you're making it for somebody else. You might want to know that. All right, so let me take you to one I already did. Okay, so let me tell you, this is information overload, isn't it? Yes, and you're thinking to yourself already, I must be crazy. But uh, this is a really good idea of what I'm doing here. So, uh, okay, I don't want to make my friends upset, but I, a lot of times I get people who want me to make stuff kind of like it's on a whim. Oh, can you do such and such and such and such? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I can, but... You really need to understand what goes on through that process. It's not just like easy peasy lemon squeezy. And I'd be more than happy to do it. But you kind of have to think about what you're asking me. You know, it's not like you're asking me to run a Walmart and get you a pair of socks. Okay, anyway. All right, so here's a women's sock. Uh, on the inside, of course. I scratched in my 64. I didn't write my gauge. I know it, but I didn't write it. Uh... My foot tent, this foot length is 10 inches, okay, because this is for my sister-in-law. I think it was a size eight and a half or something. Uh, needles used, Gearheart 64. I do have two different sets of needles for different cylinders. Uh, Gearheart needles for a certain cylinder, and if I change cylinders, I have the auto needle, knitter needles for that cylinder. So I'm just sticking with the Gearheart ones. And the number, of course, is 64. It's a cuff down sock. The leg is 110 rows. So from the top to where the heel starts is 110. What I did is I left myself enough rows to unravel the first uh, maybe 15, 20 rows. Yeah, about 20 rows. Maybe a little more depending on how deep I want my rib. And so I will unravel those rows after I put them onto the needle, picked up stitches, put them onto the needle, and I will do the, the rib process myself on the needle. And I have that one in progress. Maybe I'll show you. And then, so that accounts for that length. And that should put it right below the calf muscle, because uh, I did measure that one, and take me to where the heel starts. Now, when I do my heel, it's going to be approximately 50 rows. So I'm watching on the counter and the digital counter will get me to 110. Once I've cranked straight to 110, I'll start my heel. From where I start my heel to the end of the heel should take me about 50 rows, roughly. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And I make sure to mark that in the book, what the actual was versus what the assumed was. Then from the heel to the foot, is going to be 50 rows okay and that would be about 10 inches and then I have a, a approximate for the toe based on the um, what the guide said when I did the calculation so 48 for the toe 
okay? And that tells me exactly where to start. So I crank 50. And I, what I'm doing is the, the, the machine is adding it up constantly. So I have to kind of do a little math here. I got to add the 110 plus 50 plus the other 50. And that, then I know when I hit that number that this is where, when I'm going to start. Okay, so for that one, row uh, 210 was where I was supposed to start the toe. Okay, we don't want to mess that up. Oh, it's okay if I mess it up on the first one. I just to make sure that whatever I did on this one, I do for the second one. Okay, now, see, right here I have the leg. I wrote down my heels at 160, my foot is 50, and then my toe was at 258, right? And then I have, like, the total. Bam, so I know exactly how many rows. And then down here I have who this sock was for and the date that I actually did this sock. Okay, so in that particular sock, um, hold on a moment, let me go get that sock. Okay, I know you all must be going into information overload. So here's that particular sock. Okay, 110. And, ooh, you know what? I, the green, when I did this, it didn't quite match up. So I'm ignoring a small space of this green, which is why I brought this so far down past the like 20 or so rows that I want to do for the rib. And as you see, I'm picking up the stitches down here, picking them up, putting them on the needle so I can do the ribbing. Okay, and then there's our 110 and our heel and our 50 and our toe here okay and that's basically what that looks like uh i'll show you what the toe looks like when it comes out open and everything like that that's how i plan the sock okay so that's just the first stage of playing the sock then i have to go to prepping the yarn okay i'm going to stop here in this particular video and in the next video i'm going to show you how i prep the yarn